Hello Year 6 and welcome to a, well Friday's guided reading session. This is our last guided reading session of the term before we have half term. And we've read so much of this book throughout the, um, throughout the term and when we come back we won't have too much more left to read. So we're going to finish the chapter today and we'll probably keep on reading a little bit and then we're going to have obviously a few questions and we're going to have to fill in a few blanks um, from the chapter, okay? So as we can see, Bilbo and the dwarves have just got out of the palace and now, now they're floating down the river. I do hope I put the lids on tight enough, he thought, but before long he was worrying too much about himself to remember the dwarves. He managed to keep his head above the water, but he was shivering with the cold and he wondered if he would die of it before the luck turned, and how much longer he would be able to hang on, and whether he should risk the chance of letting go and trying to swim to the bank. The luck turned all right before long. The eddying current carried several barrels close to shore at one point, and there for a while they stuck against some hidden root. Then Bilbo took the opportunity of scrambling up the side of his barrel, which it was held steady against another. Up he crawled like a drowned rat, and lay on the top spread out to keep the balance as best he could. The breeze was cold, but better than the water, and he hoped he would not suddenly roll off again when they started off once more. Before long, the barrels broke free again and turned and twisted off down the stream and out into the main current. Then he found it quite as difficult to stick on it as he feared, but he managed it somehow, though it was miserably uncomfortable. Luckily, he was light and the barrel was a good big one and being rather leaky, had now shipped in a small amount of water. All the same, it was like trying to ride, without bridle or stirrups, a round-bellied pony that was always thinking of rolling in the grass. In this way at last, Mr Baggins came to a place where the trees on either hand grew thinner. He could see the paler sky between them. The dark river opened suddenly wide, and there it was joined to the main river, main water of the forest river, flowing down in haste from the king's great doors. There was a dim sheet of water, no longer overshadowed, and on its sliding surface there was dancing and broken reflections of clouds and of stars. Then the hurrying water of the forest river swept all the company of casks and tubs away to the north bank, in which it had eaten out a wide bay. This had a shingly shore under hanging banks and was walled at the eastern end by a little jutting cape of hard rock. On the shallow shore, most of the barrels ran aground, though a few went on to bump against the stony pier. There were people on the lookout on the banks. They quickly pulled and pushed all the barrels together into the shallows, and when they had counted them, they roped them together and left them till the morning. Poor dwarves! Bilbo was not badly off now. He slipped from his barrel and waded ashore, and then sneaked along to some huts that he could see near the water's edge. He no longer thought twice about picking up a supper uninvited if he got the chance. He had been obliged to do it for so long, and he knew now only too well what it was like to be really hungry not merely politely interested in the dainties of a well-filled larder. Also, he had caught a glimpse of a fire through the trees, and that appealed to him with his dripping and ragged clothes clinging to him, cold and clammy. There is no need to tell you much of his adventures that night, for now we are drawing near the end of the eastward journey and coming to the last and greatest adventure, so we must hurry on. Of course, helped by his magic ring, he got on very well at first, but he was given in the way in the end by his sweat footsteps and the trail of drippings that he left wherever he went or sat. And also, he began to snivel, and wherever he tried to hide, he was found out by the terrified explosions of his suppressed sneezes. Very soon, there was a fine commotion in the village by the riverside, but Bilbo escaped into the woods carrying a loaf and a leather bottle of wine and a pie that did not belong to him. The rest of the night he had to pass wet as he was and far from a fire, but the hot bottle helped him to do that, and he actually dozed a little on some dry leaves, even though the year was getting late and the air was chilly. He woke again with a specially loud sneeze. It was already grey morning, and there was a merry racket down by the river. They were making up a raft of barrels, and the raft elves would soon be stirring it off again down the stream to Lake Town. Bieber, Bilbo sneezed again. He was no longer dripping, but he felt cold all over. He scrabbled down as fast as his stiff legs would carry him, managed just in time to get on to the mass of casks without being noticed in the general bustle. Luckily, there was no sun at the time to cast an awkward shadow, and for a mercy, he did not sneeze again for a good while. There were a mighty pushing of poles. The elves that were standing in the shallow water heaved and shoved. The barrels now all lashed together, creaked and fretted. 
This is a heavy load, some grumbled. They float too deep. Some of these are never empty. If they had come ashore in the daylight, we might have had a look inside, they said. No time now, cried the raftsman. Shove off. And off they went at last, slowly at first, until they had passed the point of rock where other elves stood to fend them off with poles, and then quicker and quicker as they caught the main stream and went sailing away, down, down, towards the lake. They had escaped the dungeons of the king and were through the wood, but whether alive or dead still remains to be seen. Okay, and that is the end of the chapter, and we can see the dwarf here in the barrel, can't we? And we're going to continue our reading, actually, um, and we're just going to read the start of chapter 10, and then after this, you're going to have to go back and answer some questions on chapter 9, which was quite a short chapter, really. The day grew lighter and warmer as they floated along. After a while, the river rounded a steep shoulder of land that came down upon their left. Under its rocky feet, like an inland cliff, the deepest stream had flowed, lapping and bubbling. Suddenly, the cliff fell away, the shores sank, the trees ended, then Bilbo saw a sight. The lands opened wide about him, filled with the waters of the river, which broke up and wandered in a hundred winding courses, or halted in marshes, and pools dotted with isles on every side. But still a strong water flowed on steadily through the mist, and far away, its dark head in a torn cloud, there loomed the mountain. Its nearest neighbours in the northeast, and the tumbled land that joined it to them could not be seen. All alone it rose and looked across the marshes to the forest. The lonely mountain. Bilbo had come far and through many adventures to see it, and now he did not like the look of it in the least. As he listened to the talk of the raftmen and pierced together the scraps of information they let fall, he soon realised that it was very fortunate ever to have seen it at all, even from this distance. Dreary as had been his imprisonment, and unpleasant as his, as was his position, to say nothing of the poor dwarves underneath him still, he had been luck more lucky than he had guessed. The talk was all of trade that came and went to the waterways, and the growth of the traffic on the river, as the roads out of the east towards Mirkwood vanished or fell into d d disuse, and of the bickerings of the lake men and the wood elves about the upkeep of the forest river and the care of the banks. Those lands had changed much since the days when dwarves dwelt in the mountain, days which most people now remembered only as very shadowy tradition. They had changed even in recent years, and since the last news that Gandalf had heard of them. Great floods and rains had swollen the rivers that flowed east, and there had been an earthquake or two, which some were inclined to attribute to the dragon, alluding to him chiefly with a curse and an anonymous nod in the direction of the mountain. The marshes and bogs had spread wider and wider on either side. Paths had vanished, and many a rider and wanderer too, if they had tried to find the lost ways across. The elf road th through the wood, which the dwarves had followed on the advice of Bjorn, now came to a doubtful and little-used end at the eastern edge of the forest. Only the river offered any longer a safe way from the skirts of Mirkwood in the north to the mountain-shadowed plains beyond, and the river was guarded by the wood elves' king. So you see, Bilbo had come in the end by the only road that was any good. It might have been some comfort to Mr Baggins shivering on the barrels, if he had known the news of this had reached Gandalf far away and had given him great anxiety, and that he was in fact finishing his other business, which does not come into this tale, and getting ready to come in search of Thorin's company. But Bilbo did not know it, and he knew that the river seemed to go on and on and on forever, and he was hungry and had a nasty cold in the nose, and did not like the way the mountain seemed to frown at him and threaten him as it drew ever nearer. After a while, however, the river took a more southerly course, and the mountain receded again, and at last, late in the day, the shores grew rocky. The river gathered all its wandering waters together into a deep and rapid flood, and they swept along at great speed. The sun had set when turning with another sweep towards the east, the forest river rushed into the long lake. There it had a wide mouth with stony cliff-like gates at either side, whose feet were piled with shingles. The long lake! Bilbo had never imagined that any water that was not the sea could look so big. It was so wide that the opposite shores looked small and far, but it was so long that its northerly end, which pointed towards the mountain, could not be seen at all. Only when the map did... Only from the map did Bilbo know that away up there, where the stars of the wane were always twinkling, the running river came down into the lake from Dale, 
and with the forest river filled with deep waters what must once have been a great deep rocky valley. At the southern end of the double waters poured out again uh, over high waterfalls and ran away hurriedly to unknown lands. In the still evening air the noise of the falls could be heard like a distant roar. Not far from the mouth of the forest river was the strange town he had heard the elves speak of in the king's cellars. It was not built on the shore, though there were a few huts and buildings there. But right out on the surface of the lake, protected from the swirl of the entering river by a promontory of rock which formed a calm bay. A great, a great bridge made out of wood ran out to where, to where on huge piles made of forest trees were built a busy wooden town. Not a town of elves, but of men, who still dared to dwell here under the shadow of the distant Dragon Mountain. There they throve on the trade that came up the great river from the south, and was carted past the falls to their town. But in the great days of old, when Dale in the north was rich and prosperous, they had been wealthy and powerful. And there had been fleets of boats on the waters, and some were filled with gold, and some with warriors in armour, and there had been wars and deeds which were, were now only a legend. The rotting piles of a greater town could still be seen along the shores where the waters sank in a drought. But men remembered little of that, though some still sang song, songs of the dwarf kings of the mountain, Thor and Thrain of the race of Durin, and of the coming of the dragon, and the fall of the lords of Dale. Some sang too that Thor and Thrain would come back one day and gold would flow in rivers through the mountain gates and all that land would be filled with a new, with a new song and new laughter. But this pleasant legend did not much affect their daily business. Okay, we're going to stop there. And so now you need to go back and you need to answer the questions, the comprehension questions on chapter 9. Okay, so go back, answer those questions and then you've finished your reading for this term. Well done for reading along with me, and when we come back after half term, we're going to finish the book. <laughs>